Um, two topics for us today. Uh, we're going to be covering um, two sections of the of the book. Chapter 4.9 and 4.10. And um, there are uh, two ideas that I'd like to cover for you today. Um, the first idea has to do with uh, the relationship between what we did with the Coleman filter, which is basically to take into account our prior belief the uncertainty that we had on the estimate that we're making and the current observation. And I want to link that to maximum likelihood, which was the process by which we took data and we said, what's the likelihood of this data being generated given our model? And from that, we learned that, for example, when we have two sensors, we want to weigh each sensor based on our uncertainty. So um, one of the problems that you face when you want to apply some of these techniques to real data is that, well, what should your uncertainty be when you start your estimate, for example? What, what should you start with? And um, uh, to show you how, how you can compute a reasonable starting uncertainty, what we're going to do is go back to our problem with the two GPSs. So we have two GPSs. They estimate our location, and we're going to combine them. And we saw that in maximum likelihood how to do it. So now let's do the same problem, but using the, the Coleman approach. And, but we're going to begin with an idea that we have no prior belief. So if I have no prior belief, so my prior uncertainty is going to be a particular structure. It's going to be basically infinite. I have no idea where I am. I make these two measurements. And then I want to show you that if that's the case, then you end up with a scenario where your belief, after you take the measurements, is the maximum likelihood. So maximum likelihood is the solution when you essentially have no prior belief. If you have a prior belief, then when you use the Coleman filter, you know how to apply the prior belief with the current observation. Maximum likelihood, all we do is we take the observation and say, what's the most likely location? In a Coleman filter, we have this additional thing which says, well, we also have this prior stuff that we've seen, and we're going to combine where I believe I am with the data that I see. And of course, then the Coleman filter becomes a, a segue into Bayesian way of thinking about estimation, which is where we're eventually going. So let's go back to our problem of hiking in the woods. We are at some location x, and we have two sensors. And um, you know, you can imagine that you keep on walking, and every time you take a few steps, you take another, another uh, estimate. So you know, your position is going to change as a function of time and say that that relationship is done by this matrix A, and then you're going to take another sample. So if we were to write our model, our generative model, it would look like this. That x in trial n is equal to A times x in trial n minus 1. These are vectors, 2 by 1 vectors, plus epsilon x where this is normally distributed with 0 and q being its uh, variance covariance matrix. And your observation y uh, times n is going to be c times um, vector x, where here now your observation is a 4 by 1. You get a two two-dimensional vectors. And so this is a, um, this is a 2 by 1. This is a 4 by 2 plus epsilon y, where epsilon y is normally distributed with, this is your measurement noise, with variance 0 and q. Uh, sorry, 0 and r. And so say that this is the, this is the system that I have. I want to estimate where I am. So if you do it via the common filter approach, what you do is that you say you have some prior belief. You have some x hat in trial n given n minus 1. And for the purpose of our experiment here, let's just say that this is the very first trial. So I'm going to say trial 1, given that I've seen nothing in the past. That's my very first prior belief. And it has some uncertainty associated with it, p of 1 given 0. This is, this is how I start. I, I have some prior belief about where I am. I have some uncertainty about where I am. And now I'm going to make a measurement. And then I'm going to update what I, what I think uh, where I am. So my x hat of 
1 given 1 is equal to x hat of 1 given 0 plus my common gain k of 1 times my observation y of 1 minus my prediction y hat of 1 where y hat of 1 is just c times x hat of 1 given 0. My, my prior times this matrix C tells me my guess on that trial. And so this is, what, this is what you would do to update your belief about where you are based on your prior belief and your observation. Any questions about that? OK, so now let's ask, what if I don't have a prior belief? You know, I have no idea where I am. I was placed on this place, and I don't know where I am. So for me, my prior uncertainty is infinity. I could be anywhere. Okay, so then how do we do this? How do we do this now? Because how would I be able to compute this matrix K and so forth? So um, what we know from the uh, the work that we did on uh, last last lecture, K in principle for this problem, K of n, is going to be equal to P of n n minus one times um, C transpose times the variance of this structure, my observation, C times P of n, n minus 1, C transpose plus R minus 1. And the shape of K, what is this matrix K? It's going to be, so this is X is a 2 by 1. K is going to be, Y is a 4 by 1. So this is going to be a 2 by 4. K will be a 2 by 4 matrix in order for this problem to work out. And um, this matrix C is a 4 by 2. So P, P is my uncertainty. And P is a 2 by 2. It's a 2 by 2 matrix. Because X is a 2 by 1, so my uncertainty about X is just a 2 by 2. So let's see if this works out. So K is a 2 by 4, and P is a 2 by 2. C is a 4 by 2, but transpose is a 2 by 4, so it looks, looks pretty good. And R is a 4 by 4, and so this must be a 4 by 4 as well. That looks pretty good. So that looks fine. All right. So um, that's the how I'm going to compute my common gain. But my problem is that this, this thing here that I call my prior uncertainty is infinite. So I, I don't know how to compute this thing. So I'm going to show you how to do it. Um, to do it, we're going to add one more step here, which has to do with the posterior uncertainty. So my posterior uncertainty, P of n given n, is equal to um, i minus um, k times c times p of n given n minus 1. Let's see if that works out. So k is a 2 by 4, c is a 4 by 2. So 2 by 2, this is a 2 by 2, yeah, so that looks good. Okay. So let me, let me write this out. What I'm going to do is to um, show you how the, the posterior uncertainty is related to the prior uncertainty. But I'm going to do it not in terms of the matrices. I'm going to do it in terms of the inverse of the matrices. And by doing it that way, so I'm going to write a new equation for you after a couple of steps where I'm going to show that P of n given n minus 1 is equal to something that's going to have P of n, n minus 1, minus 1, and then some other stuff in there. So by writing it this way, what I'm going to be able to do is to get rid of this. Because if this is infinite, P of n given n minus 1, if I start out with an uncertainty that's infinite, then this is 0. So then I'm, I'm going to be OK. I can, I can still compute my posterior uncertainty. So the first step is I'm going to rewrite this equation not in terms of the matrices P and P of n, 
but in terms of the inverse of those matrices. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this, this prior uncertainty, because in this case, it's infinite. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this equation not in terms of the prior uncertainty, but in terms of the posterior uncertainty. So these are the two steps we're going to do. And then by doing so, we're going to be able to compute the common gain, even though we have a infinite uncertainty about our, our past. And when I do that, you're going to see that we're going to end up with the maximum likelihood estimate. Basically, what we're going to end up with is this weighing of these two x, these two y a and y b, based on their prior, on their basically variance, which is our maximum likelihood estimate. Because if you have no prior belief, effectively what you're doing is only taking the evidence, and that evidence is going to be weighted by its variance, which in this case is in that matrix R. Okay, so let's let's go let's go through it. Before I go, do you have any questions about where we're going? So our problem is we start out with infinite uncertainty. We have no idea where we are. If we're in that scenario, how the heck can we compute k? We can't. Because based on that equation, I have to have a, you know, I can't multiply something by infinite. Right? The way we're going to do it is by rewrite our problem in terms of not p's, but the inverse of p's. And then we're going to be able to handle it. But then what we're going to end up with is this idea that effectively our common gain is going to be the maximum likelihood estimator because we have no prior belief. Our prior belief is flat. All right. So let me write this equation. So this is. I'm going to replace k with um, what it is. OK. So this, this equation here can be simplified. Now, how the heck can that be simplified? There's a lemma that I'm going to use. It's called the matrix inversion lemma. And the matrix inversion lemma is as follows. It says that if you have this quantity, z minus x, y minus 1, x transpose, quantity minus 1, then that's equal to z minus 1 plus z minus 1 x, y minus x transpose z minus 1 x minus 1, x transpose z minus 1. So if you look at this equation here, what we're going to do, oh, I, I, I think I, I missed the. Uh, I missed a C here. K times there's a there's a C here. Yeah. Yeah, right. So basically I'm gonna be able to rewrite this equation like this, as an inverse of something. And how am I gonna do that? Well, I'm gonna set z minus 1 to be um, to be equal to minus my prior uncertainty. I'm going to set x to be equal to c transpose. And I'm going to set um, y to be equal to r. <coughs> so let's see if we can do it. So this means that this equation can be written as
times minus z plus this becomes a minus here. And if I take this and I write it as this, this becomes a plus. Yeah. Okay. So I multiply that by a minus. So basically, this is just minus of this equation, right? Which means I have that equation on top is equal to this, this minus z, which is equal to. Um, C transpose y minus 1, r minus 1, x transpose c minus 1. So I have Wow. I got it right. Pretty good. <coughs> OK. Um, so I'm going to invert both sides. P of n given n minus 1 is equal to inverse of this, C transpose r minus 1c plus P of n n minus 1. Did I? I think I have an inverse there that I missed. Yeah, this is a z here, not a z minus 1. This is a minus 1. Yeah. So p of n given n, its inverse is equal to p of n n minus 1 inverse plus c transpose r minus 1c. Yeah, that's what I got. OK. So what this means is that if, if I start with my p of 1 give a 0 is equal to infinity, then if I, after I take my first sample, then my posterior uncertainty, p of 1 given 1, is going to be equal to c transpose r minus 1c. So if I start with knowing nothing, after I take my first sample, what I know has an uncertainty equal to C transpose R minus 1C, where R is the measurement, un measurement, the measurement noise. OK. Any, any questions so far? Yeah. This one here? Yeah. Oh, because this is just 0. Yeah. And then on the bottom you have P1 given 1 yeah. without the inverse. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. You're right. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Yep. Yep, sorry. That would have come back to haunt me later. <laughs> OK. All right. So all we've done so far is to, sh to show that if we have no information to begin with, if we have infinite uncertainty, we can compute our, so we can still compute our posterior uncertainty. Now, 
This is a good first step. The second step what we need to do is to take the common gain and the way it's written up there, which is written in terms of the prior uncertainty, rewrite it in terms of the posterior uncertainty, this term, which we can do. And I'll, and I'll show you how to do it. So before I do it, just to give you an, an, an heuristic that, that's useful in, in state estimation, if you begin your estimate with having no idea, then oftentimes what people do is they say, well, let's begin with a prior estimate that's equal to this, which is basically what they're saying is that let's begin with an estimate that is going to end up being our prior after we take this first sample anyway. So a, a reasonable prior uncertainty is this, if you know nothing else. All right. Now let's look at um, our, uh, our uh, the way we wrote k. So we have k of n. What I'm going to do is I multiply both sides by the inverse of that matrix there. So I'm going to get c times the prior. So I'm just rewriting that equation. OK, um, I'm going to multiply both sides by r minus 1. And I can do this because you know these, these, these are, mo these are uh, variance covariance matrices, so they're positive definite matrices. I can always have an, I will always have an inverse for them. I'll multiply it through. All right, um, let me solve for k. And uh, keeping in mind that we have this, this thing that is interesting for us. It, it's giving us a relationship between the prior uncertainty and the posterior uncertainty. And what I'm going to show you is that we can get that out of here as well. So um, so I'm going to bring these two terms together. This is this. So P of n given n, C transpose R minus 1. Did I miss a minus? No? Oh. Oh, yeah, because. From there to the next one. Right. 
So then, okay. So what I've now written is my common gain in terms of the posterior uncertainty, which I can take a step further. That means k of n is equal to, here's the posterior uncertainty after I take the first step. So at the end of my first data point, I'm going to call that k1. That's going to be equal to c transpose r minus 1 c minus 1 c transpose r minus 1. And so this is what the common gain would be on that first data point that I'm going to take, which means that my x hat 1, 1 is equal to, say that my prior is x hat of 1, 0 is equal to 0, p of 1, 0 is equal to infinity, then my posterior, after I take my first data point, is going to be equal to k of 1 times y of 1 minus y hat of 1. This is 0. So this means that my posterior, after I take the first data point, is going to be equal to this, c transpose r minus 1, c minus 1, c transpose r minus 1, y, my observation. And if you look at what we did with maximum likelihood, this is the maximum likelihood estimate. Which is basically, look, at, look, look what it's doing, is that it's weighing the observation by the inverse of the noises in each measurement and then normalizing it. And if you put in the numbers, that exactly turns out to be like the, um, like the maximum likelihood. OK, so what we did were we learned a couple of things. One, we learned matrix inversion. Lemma. It's a useful lemma that we're going to use again when we do um, Bayesian uh, estimation. The second thing we learned is that we can form of an estimate of a posterior uncertainty even if our prior uncertainty is infinite. And we can form an estimate of the common gain, which is, here it is, even if our prior is infinite. And given that, basic meaning of a prior that's infinite is a maximum likelihood estimator. It means that you basically all you know is the current measurement. You don't know anything else. And if you have a prior estimate, then with a the common gain, you get to incorporate both of those two things together, both your prior and the noise in your measurement. OK? OK. So let me now switch our topic to a different um, a different topic, which has to do with um, noise. And in, in the kinds of experiments that you've been seeing here, the kinds of mathematics we've been doing, we always have this additive noise. And that additive noise has a variance structure that's a Gaussian. In biological problems, that's not the case. It's not the case that when you look at a biological system, the noise in it is going to be Gaussian. What noise is going to look like is going to be what's, what's called signal dependent. What that means is that if you take your hand and you push on a force transducer and you measure the little wiggle, the little force wiggles, look at the standard deviation of that. As you increase the magnitude of the force, the standard deviation of that signal is going to increase. So what that means is that the variability in the signal is not independent of the mean. And if you look at those equations that I wrote, I put down normal zero q. That means, you know, doesn't matter, doesn't matter what your mean is, they're independent in these cases. Now what we want to consider are scenarios that are more biological where noise is going to be dependent on the magnitude of the signal. And what I want to show you is that when we do it in that way, then the common gain which is written up there. So you notice here that this gain has no x's in it. It has nothing that says that I, the value of x matters to me. All I care about is the uncertainty in your measurement. And that's all I need to know to formulate my gain. 
But if the noise structure is such that what, what you're measuring depends not just on a measurement noise, that's in this case um, Gaussian with an independent mean, but if this noise depends on x, the bigger the x is, the bigger the noise is, if your sensors are like that, which is what biological sensors are, then this k is also going to depend on your x. So it's going to give you a way to weigh what you're seeing based on your uncertainty of measurement as well as the value of that x that you're trying to estimate. And so this is called signal dependent noise. And I want to show you how to handle it. And what's, what's nice about this is that um, the first paper that showed how to do this came out about 10 years ago or so. So because you know people in engineering were happy with the common way of describing things, even though um, almost I think no real system has a just a Gaussian noise that's independent of its mean. Most systems have the signal dependence structure. Until people began thinking about biological systems, they hadn't considered, um, considered this. So anyway, let me, it's not a difficult thing. It's pretty easy to do it, and it's pretty important for, um, for our process. So what is the signal dependent noise? Um, so signal dependent noise. What do I mean by that? Um, if, you, if you ask somebody to make a movement, say 10 centimeters, and as they make the movement, so this is 10 centimeters, this is distance, you measure the standard deviation of their endpoint. So you know that you give them a target, you remove feedback, you ask them to move, they move. And you ask, okay, here's where you want. You do it again, and you do it again. You see there's some, there's some standard deviation, so say it's here. And now if you ask them to make a 20 centimeter movement, but in the same duration, so you fix the amount of time that they have. So they have to move faster. So here, they move like this. Now, they have to move 20 centimeters, but with the same duration, so they have to move faster. Now what you see is that their endpoint variance increases, and it will continue increasing. So say that you, you, this is because you give them like 300 milliseconds to make these movements. Distance. So this is distance in centimeter, and this is standard deviation of the endpoint where they end up. Basically, what you see is that their variability is increasing as the faster they move. The bigger the signal gets to their muscles, the more noise they have at their endpoint. Simpler way to see this is basically to ask somebody to produce force, and you measure the mean of the force and you plot the standard deviation of the force here. So you know, you, you ask somebody to produce one newton. Then you tell them, okay, produce two newtons. And every time they produce it, you know, they, 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 they produce the force and they stay there, and then you remove visual feedback and you see there's some wiggle there. And then you have to produce two newtons and you see that the wiggle is a little bit higher, and so forth. And you, and you plot this standard deviation, you again see, you know, that basically the standard deviation increases as the mean of the force increases. So what does that mean? That means that force is equal to some input that the brain is sending. Let's call that U. <coughs> this is force. <coughs> this is the input that your brain is sending to your muscles. And that's getting multiplied by something like this. C plus phi, one, time, uh, one plus C phi, where phi is normally distributed, let's call it with 0, 1. And if I now ask what's the variance of f, what's the variance of this force, that's equal to the variance of this random variable here. And that's going to be equal to u squared c squared times variance of phi, which is equal, in this case, 1, u squared c squared. So if I plot variance as a function of u, this is u. This is the input to the muscles. This is variance of force. It will look like this. It will be a quadratic, right? Because it's just going to increase as a function of u squared. And if I plot the standard deviation of it, as a function of u, it's going to be a line. It's going to be the square root of it. So that's what signal-dependent noise is. It's basically a noise structure where 
you're getting multiplication of a, an input by the random variable, not just the summation. See up here, you just have the addition here. Now, I have, this is multiplying this. And so its variance is going to depend on the variance of the random variable. And if the random variable happens to have variance 1, then you know, C is going to give you the standard devi deviation between the mean and the input. OK. So the general problem for estimation, we can now write it as follows. That basically, we have some variable x that we're trying to estimate. We're going to observe this variable with some variable y. There's some input u that's going to be affecting the state. So maybe this is you know, the, the thrust in the rocket. x is the position of the rocket. y is the telemetry from the rocket. u may be the force that I'm producing on my muscles. x is the position of my body. y is the sensory feedback that I'm getting. And then you know, with time, x changes. Let's call this matrix A. Another U is going to be acting on it. And then I'm going to measure Y. So this is the basic setup for the state estimation. Um, X of n plus 1 is equal to A of X of n. And um, the relationship between U and X is via some matrix B plus B times um, u plus, there's some noise here, let's call it epsilon u, plus another kind of noise, epsilon x. And I have my measurement, y of n is, um, let's call this h. The readout of the state. So there may be some subset of states that I can read. Um, and this is also corrupted by noise. Uh, what do I call it? <coughs> I don't know what, I don't remember what I call this noise in your book. I think I call this. Is this S? This is S? OK, great. Um, plus um, epsilon y. So the, the quantities that we're interested in that are different than before are these two. Um, and they, they are state dependent uh, noises. They're signal dependent noises. This noise is our usual noise, normal 0 qx normal 0, um, I don't know if I call it y or r, qy, I guess. And these are the uh, signal dependent noises. And uh, I want to be able to, I want to be able to write them in a way that I can um, deal with them. And the interesting idea is to write them as a, as a sum, which, um, which I'll do it for you now to see how, how that's going to help. So basically, what are they? So epsilon u is the noise in the motor commands. And you know, there may be, so maybe u is a vector. So maybe there's a, um, uh, there's a, a standard deviation of it that grows with the quantity c1, u1, phi1, c2, u2, phi2. And then depending on how big u is, cm, um, phi m, where these phi's are all normally distributed with variance 1. And c is the, the, the gain that determines basically this, this slope. So for each of the components of u, I have some signal dependent property. So you see that this noise depends on u. <coughs> OK. Similarly, I can write it for x that way. So epsilon s, let's call it d1 times x1, call it mu1, the, the random variable, d2, x2, mu2, dn, xn, mu n, 
where mu now is a random variable with um, mean 0 and um, um, variance 1. So now this noise and this noise, I can write it as follows. Um, I can write epsilon u as a sum of i is equal to 1 to m of some new matrix that I'm going to call C. I'm going to define it in a minute. It's called the CI times UI times phi i, where this matrix CI is going to have a single, oh, I can do it here. This matrix C1 is going to be equal to C1, this C1, and then 0 everywhere else. Similarly, C2 is going to be 0, C2, 0, 0, 0. Everything else is 0. So this matrix only has one number in it. And that happens to be this C2. This matrix is going to have one number, and that happens to be this C1. So that's what this matrix is. All I've done is to write this vector in terms of sum of some matrices C, which I know what it is, the noises, times the input U times um, the, uh, the random variable phi. And I, actually, U is now a vector, the vector U. Now, why did I do this? Because what I remember, what, in order for me to compute the common gain, what I need to know is my posterior uncertainty, which means I have to know the variances of these equations. I have to know the variance of y. For me to compute variance of y, if I write it in terms of this, right, now I can compute the variance of epsilon u, right? Because now the variance of epsilon u is going to be equal to the sum times ci u times variance of phi i, which is 1, times u transpose ci transpose. So this is a very critical step, because in order for me to compute the posterior uncertainty, the common gain, and all that stuff, I have to be able to compute variances here. And here's the variance. And similarly for this guy here. So I can write epsilon s is equal to the sum of some new matrix di times x times um, mu i i is equal to 1 to n. All right, so now I can write x of n plus 1 is going to be equal to a x of n plus b u of n plus b times sum of ci u of n times phi i um, plus epsilon x. And y of n is equal to be h times x of n plus h times sum of di x of n mu i plus epsilon um, y. All right. So when I want to make my posterior, now, now I want to estimate my state x. x hat of n given n is going to be equal to x hat of n given n minus 1 plus b times u of n. I know this. This is one of the things I can read. Um, uh, plus k of n times y of n minus y hat of n. What's y hat of n? It's h times x hat of n n minus 1. So that's my prior. I'm going to make a guess. I have an error in my guess. I'm going to multiply by the common gain, update my prior belief, and form a posterior belief. OK, so you know, similar to this now, what, what one has to do is to 
to form the the um, uh, posterior uncertainty, minimize the posterior uncertainty um, given. Uh, actually, sorry, this is this already incorporates my my U into it. Um, so what we do is that we write. This y is here. Let me let me uh, bring up all the h x hat of n n minus one to one side. I minus k of n h x hat of n minus 1 plus k of n this sum okay so what we do is that we form the posterior uncertainty p of n given n is equal to this times p of n n minus 1, this minus 1, plus the uncertainties here, which um, have this shape, k of n. This is the random variable here, and this is the random variable. So this becomes um, sum of h d of i x of n d of i h transpose plus this is qy times k of n transpose. So to find k, you find the variance. Here's the variance. You minimize the trace of that. So the trace of p of n given n, the derivative of that with respect to k of n. And what, what we're going to end up with now is that there's going to be this term here. So before, we used to just have this qy in there. But now we have this x in there which we didn't have before. And, and if one finds a derivative, you get k of n is equal to um, the uh, p of n, n minus 1 h transpose times the variance associated with the observation, which is um, um, this. h times epsilon, which is sum of h di x of n di h transpose plus qy minus 1. The ratio of prior uncertainty to measurement measurement uncertainty <coughs> oh i missed one term This uncertainty plus this uncertainty plus this, which becomes my measurement uncertainty, which now you see it depends on x. So basically, the larger your state is, the more uncertain you're going to be based on the fact that there's signal dependent noise in your measurement. So, what this says is that if there is signal dependent noise in your sensors, if your sensors have trouble measuring large numbers, because as the numbers get larger, the variance in them gets larger, then 
your gain in by which you estimate where you are depends not just on your measurement noise, it also depends on your estimate of where you are. So typically, this becomes your prior. You put your prior for x here. That's your best estimate of x. So the farther, the larger the state is, if the signal dependent noise depends on that state, that itself becomes a measure by which it weighs how you predict where you are. Your k depends not just on your measurement noise, typically being just dependent on epsilon y, but also depends on the signal dependent noise, and that goes into the denominator. So always we have a ratio of two things. Ratio of prior uncertainty to a measurement uncertainty. And in this case, the measurement uncertainty is going to have the signal dependent noise in it. We're going to see in a few lectures terms like this again when we do optimal control because typically noise in biological systems has this structure. It has this, it has this uh, signal dependent structure. And what we need to do is find the variance of these kinds of structures. And so the way we're going to do it is by divide it up by this sum. So we're going to represent this vector as a sum. And then by doing so, we can find this variance. And then the rest of it is just the usual traces and derivatives of traces. OK? All right, guys. Good luck with the homework, and I'll see you Monday.